The Chicago Rippers, also known as the Ripper Crew, were a gang of four psychopaths who murdered up to 20 women in Chicago over the course of just a year and a half during the 80s, in a criminally underreported and largely forgotten crime spree. This is a gruesome case of the Chicago Rippers. Welcome to Enter the Dark. Hello and welcome to Enter the Dark. I am Jan. With me as always is Leslie. okay? Yeah. Take two because you were coughing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a big cough. Yeah, well, it was a very big cough, yeah. Um, he's okay, he's not dead or anything. Um, but yeah, welcome. Um, this one is on the Chicago Rippers, aka the Chicago Ripper Crew. Um, not many people know about this one. And no. I think it's criminal because it's so gross. It's probably one of the most gruesome ones that we've ever covered. Um, so we won't wait long we'll just get into it but we do have to say first of all hello to our patrons who are kelly weaver liv templeton elizabeth lee trista francis Verena schmidt angelina chasher cookie fanner mandy madden Ulata pang becky louise jules henderson casey the cannibal and amanda champagne and also our cheerleaders who are the free members we have nicola walker slasheen b lisa o'neill heather hill alexandra gutierrez and melanie just melanie just Melanie, like share. Just Melanie. Yeah, if you do want to help us out and um, support us, you can. You can go to www.patreon.com forward slash enter the dog. Anything from a dollar up to fifty dollars, you can get free shit. Um, on YouTube, you know that platform, um, you can now become a member where you pay like two ninety nine a month or something, and I don't know. They told me set it up, so I did. Um, it's cheap. Do that if you want. There's only one tier because I couldn't be. Oh, on the members. Yeah. And yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen it. Um, you can do that if you want to. I'm not your mother. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Anyway, so the Chicago Ripper crew. Let's get into it. Basically, the Ripper cases are so named because they usually share features with the infamous Jack the Ripper case of 1888. And that is to say they usually involve um, extreme mutilations of sex workers. But while Jack the Ripper is arguably the most famous serial killer to ever exist, and Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, yeah, yeah. Um, he's been burned into the British conscience since the early 80s, the Chicago Rippers hold no such distinction even in local history. So Jack the Ripper gets his place in the history books, of course, because he was the first modern serial killer. And then the Yorkshire Ripper case only got serious investigative power after Peter Sutcliffe started murdering members of the so-called polite society. Basically, non-sex workers, really. And that was all bullshit as well, because a lot of them weren't sex workers, were they? Not really, no. Like, there was a lot of just people who were like, fuck it, there were sex workers. Yeah, yeah. But it was people who he thought may have been sex yeah. workers. He was mental, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, anyway. So, the Chicago Rippers, however, fo focus mostly on, but not exclusively, sex workers, which makes the lack of press coverage during and after the murders both predictable and also baffling. Now, out of the 20-odd people they killed, four weren't sex workers. One, however, wasn't a woman and was killed in a random shooting, but three were still sorts of victims who usually get both press and police attention, secretaries and different things like that. Now, not to mention the fact that they were also white. I'll get into this. And to the point, perhaps the reason why there wasn't such a massive sense of urgency was the vast majority of the victims in the Chicago Rippers cases were black sex workers who historically have the least amount of investigative power placed into their murder investigations. USA. Now, at the very least, the ringleader of the Chicago Rippers never admitted to anything and is still never admitted to doing anything untoward, despite mountains and mountains of eyewitness reports. No physical evidence, but there are eyewit but there is eyewitness evidence. Now, as we've said again and again and again, and it bears repeating, black sex workers, especially in the 80s and 90s, they were the ones most likely to have the letters DNI scrolled on their body meaning do not investigate. And if there's no investigation, there's usually no coverage. And it was because the investigation and the media attention was so relatively scant during the Chicago Ripper murders 
The team of four psychopaths who perpetrated these crimes operated with near impunity. Now, the Chicago Rippers would remove breasts with piano wire and have sex with the wounds, either before or after they tortured the victims with homemade implements. And it was always done in a mobile chamber of horrors that took the form of a customised red Dodge van. Probably should have trigger warning before. Yeah. 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 Fine now. Anyway, Robin Gett was born in Chicago in 1953 into a classic hard-luck serial killer environment that never let up during his entire childhood. And the only love Robin ever got was from his grandmother, Sarah, who doted upon her grandchild by saying, and I quote, You're my first grandchild. That makes you special. Okay. That means, yeah. But unfortunately for him, He was treated as far less than special throughout his formative years. His brother Everett was born three years after Robin and his sister Rochelle came two years after that. And since the get home was so small, Robin lost his bed to his two younger siblings and had to sleep on the floor. Well, that fucking special, was it? No, it was to his grandma. You know, she, like, you know... Slip 50p and he's like, well, you know, your man does. 50 cents, like, yeah, yeah, don't tell your mom. Yeah, she'd be like, no, just like, like it's a drug deal or something. But soon after, his parents abandoned him to the, he'll figure it out on his own school of parenting that often leads to, let's put it down as bad habits, Les. Yeah. Leads to bad habits. Now, when he was six, his mother and his siblings took a trip to the grocery store and his mum went inside with Robin's infant sister and told Robin to stay outside to watch his three-year-old brother, even though he was only six. Now, it's not known whether he let the events unfold or whether he pushed them along, but pretty soon his little brother Everett had wandered out into the street and got hit by a car. Now, he did survive, but with permanent brain damage. Now, Perhaps to fill the Everett-sized hole that they had in their lives, or perhaps because the Gex were just too fucking stupid to stop, they gave birth to another child in 1961, Julia. Now, after Julia in 1961, there was another, Joanne in 1964, and it therefore became Robin's job to take care of all these little girls who seemed to come in an endless stream. Why would you put him in charge of these children after he's already let his three-year-old brother get it by a car. Granted, he was six, so that's on her. <laughs> Just like, don't, like, here, six-year-old, watch this three-year-old, don't make... Uh, but Robin had to shoulder even more responsibility when his beloved grandmother died of stomach cancer and his father became ill with an unnamed blood ailment. Blood ailment, okay. Yeah. What we're reckoning? Hepatitis. I'm going to say hepatitis. That's a popular one. Yeah, let's go, one. let's go hepatitis. B or C. I can go B. That's more like all of them. All the heps. All the heps. Now, even the Audrey Hepburn. Yeah, hepatitis Hepburn. Hepatitis Hepburn. Oh, I bet she got picked on for that. Hope so. Yeah, she, well, I don't hope so. But like, I mean, I have, you know I liked Audrey Hepburn. Nothing against it. Stay Betty Day, best time. No. Nah. Anyway, so he was, Robin was, of course, a problem child at school, and he was always fighting, stealing, and starting fires, all of which could draw the ire of his father, who was, even though he couldn't work, always seemed to manage to muster up enough energy to beat his son, besides, besides his burn, itis yeah. he had. Anyway, but when the school had had enough of Robin's antisocial behaviour, he was sent first to a day school for troubled juveniles, but when he refused to attend of his own volition, Robin was sent to a troubled teen school for eight months. Now, almost certainly Robin was sent to the Chicago Parental School with the rest of the city's so-called incorrigibles. Now, as far as troubled teen schools went, this one wasn't one of the worst. So, Looking into it, it mostly modelled a military school with no corporal punishment ever allowed. Now, the worst punishment also isn't the best. They would give the kids 24 hours of solitary confinement in a well-lit, well-ventilated room, like kind of like a cool-off room. Mm-hmm. So, like, you're being a dick, you're like, right, go into this room on your own for a day and cool off. 
But after eight months at parental school, Robin was brought home after his grandfather also died, and his aunt quickly followed her father with suicide because she lost both of her parents in less than a year. It's again, as I said, a hard luck serial killer story. It's just nothing but misery, death, pain in Audrey had there. Now, looking for some purpose in life, Robin at the age of 15 began working with his dead grandfather's tools so he could learn enough electrical know-how to repair te television sets. Now, back then, that was a good trade to have. Yeah. Repairing, because no one chucked anything away. You wouldn't no, no, no. buy another one. You repair them. If you had like one television set and that'd be game for a good 20 years oh, yeah, or something. Yeah. Now, by the age of 18, he met a girl who was only known as Judy Carson. Now, Judy gave birth to the first of Robin Gecht's many, many children. But luckily for her, they broke up and she married someone else, leaving Robin far behind. So after an extremely short-lived return home in which Robin punched, was punched in the face by his father hours after his arrival... Just in. I had all gone home. Ooh. It's like, it's still got blood ailment. Yeah. Um, he drifted from woman to woman for years until he met a married 17 year old Rosemary McCaffrey in 1975 when he was 22. Now, the first child was born a year later, and two more children would be born between then and the year in which Robin was caught for the Ripper murders in 1982. Now, one of the most bizarre coincidences in the Robin Gack story came from his choice of profession. An electrician, mm -hmm. right? And it comes from who he met as a result of that career choice. Right, you ready for this? Who's he me? Now, he'd learned the basics of home repair from his uncle Roger and therefore opened up his own electrical repair business in 1975. And he moved on from TVs and he moved up to homes. Now, this is Chicago in the 1970s. So if you're doing small time work, but, you know, you're going to have to deal with contractors. There's a chance he might have worked with PDM, PDM. and its CEO, John Wayne Gacy. Oh, that dude. Yeah. The clown. Yeah. So there's no evidence of this that they'd ever kill together or anything. But, you know, John w Wayne Gacy killed men in his home and Robin Gat killed women in his van. And Gacy was. Caught in 1978, and Robin's murders didn't begin until at least 1981, or didn't probably get started until then. So they didn't kill together, but there's a very, very good chance that they he like worked for him as a contractor. So he didn't end up in a ripping situation. Yeah, mm. true. Anyway, the Ripper crew was sort of a KFC, didn't he? He did, yeah. John Wayne Gacy. Yeah, he called him. He made people call himself call him the Colonel. He wasn't the colonel. Though, no, he wasn't. He? But, you know, he made people call him the colonel. Yeah. That's good. Anyway, the Ripper crew was made up of Robin Gecht and the, the younger employees at his construction business, Eddie Spritzer and the Cockerellis brothers, Andy and Tommy. Now, Robin and his wife, Rosemary, were neighbours with the Cockerellis brothers who came from a Greek Orthodox family ruled by a violent tyrant who would lash his children after he tied them shirtless to a table. I mean, have you seen how they baptised? I know, no, yeah. Now, he usually did this for, like, little transgressions, such as smoking a little weed. You'd get 15 lashes for smoking weed. Shirtless, tied to a table, 15 fucking lashes from this big Greek guy. Now, with the shirt on, with the shirt off. He'd probably take his shirt off, too. No, it's actually worse if you leave the shirt on. Is it? Well, yeah. Because the fibres get into the wound, uh, causes infection. Now, um, we don't know exactly how Andy and Tommy were roped into Robin Gecht's life, but it's probably likely that Ro Robin just offered him jobs working as handy man at his company. Now, around 78 or 79, the fourth member of the Ripper crew arrived. Tommy and Andy, the co um, Cockerellas, had a sister, and she had a boyfriend named Eddie Spritzer. Now, after 15 months of dating, the Cockerella sister moved away and broke up with Eddie, and Eddie sued also after lost his job in an auto, auto park store. Now, Eddie asked his ex-girlfriend's brother Andy if she knew of any work, and Andy introduced him to Robin Geck, and that solidified the Ripper Crew lineup. Now, I have to say, Chicago Ripper Crew sounds like a decent punk band. Yeah, it does. It does, but, you know, it starts to get a bit murky here, so, you know, if if you are 
if you were offended by the like the boob cut off piano wire shagging the wounds probably best just to leave, like, leave a like and subscribe now and then just go go about your day but if you wanted the drug the gory detail coming into them now as far as the right hand man and the rip and the ripper crew went eddie spritzer said that he hated who he became when he was around robin but even before robin and eddie hooked up eddie was known to be a disturbing individual so a guy who knew eddie from high school said that spritzer showed up to the prom with his mouth covered in blood but instead of wiping it off he enjoyed how much it shocked everyone and he spent all night bragging that he'd just come to the prom after slaughtering animals in the woods for rituals. Fucking. What an edge lord. Yeah, he did. Now, we don't know if the prom story is true or not, because, you know, true crime paperbacks of the 90s mm -hmm. and 80s was full of, oh, someone who went to high school with, blah, 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 all that. But when asked about the period of vulnerability when he met Robin, Eddie didn't take responsibility. He said, if someone had asked me at the time to be in a porno movie or rob a bank or anything, I'm sure I would have done it. Yeah, I mean, fair. It, like, you've got to, if you're getting into porn, you've got to have some sort of cachet, like, haven't you? Ca like, yeah, you've got to be like, do you know what? My shit's okay to be on the camera. You know, you're not going to be like, got a small dick. Oh, you know, he's like, mm. you've got to go for the production values and like, yeah, yeah. I guess, like, yeah. But um, anyway, opposed to the vast majority of serial killers who begin their experimentation phases outside the home, doing it to strangers, Robin Gett went against this type and first tortured his wife, which is kind of strange that he'd do it in the home first and not outside. But what you might assume... Do it on camera? No, no. No. But what you might assume is most many serial killers aren't physically abusive towards the wife, like John Wayne Gacy... His wife said he was, like, really nice. Albert Fish's kids. Yeah. They said he was nice. Except for when they used to have to paddle, paddle his ass. Yeah, right? and roll him up in a carpet and smack him. It's very specific, isn't it? It's very. Now, um, Robin didn't follow that pattern. Um, now, I'm not going to stay for a moment. But with this, this is where it gets really disgusting. And we'll focus on the act of breast mutilation so trigger warning here we go now when robin began exuberantly marching towards serial killer behavior it's also the exact moment he began bringing eddie spritzer into the fold now after eddie worked for robin for only five months eddie went to robin's house to find that robin had cut off his wife's nipples and had left her there to bleed now eddie took her to the hospital but before he could talk to the cops robin intercepted and told him that the crime could easily be pinned on Eddie. Robin also told Eddie that he went to the cops. He'd shown pictures of Eddie and Rosemary having sex. Now, there's no evidence that they did have sex with Rosemary. Eddie said that the only sexual contact he's ever had with her when he applied lotion to her boobs when she was sunbathing topless. I mean, that's not sex, is it? It's not sex, but that's your mate's wife. Like, if Yoko said to me, oh, Yang, come in the yard, and I went out, and she's top sunbathing topless, and I'm like, can you rub this lotion on me boobs? I'd be like, no. No. You say, you'd, you'd say, say to no, bed, wouldn't you? Do you'd be like, no, nah, what's oh, going on? No. Oh, you're your own boobs. Anyway, so faced with all this trouble Robin promised, Eddie not only agreed to keep the secret, he also continued to work with Robin professionally. He'd only been there five months. Now, after Robin cut off his wife's nipples, a steady stream of teenage girls began flowing through his house. Now, these girls would party all night. Sometimes they'd refuse to leave, but Rosemary was, of course, too terrified to protest. Now, perhaps seeking to take this decadent lifestyle even further into the realm of sadistic, Robin began customising his roomy red Dodge work van and to turn it into a mobile chamber of horrors designed specifically to commit torture murders. In addition to this, his behaviour in his personal life was also descending into the depths of decadence. Cutting nipples off was only the beginning. When Robin was married to Rosemary, he also had a girlfriend named Tina who had quite a bit to say about Robin's lifestyle leading to the murders. While they were together, for example, Robin was accused of raping a 15-year-old girl at gunpoint. 
Tina said he always had a wide variety of pills at his disposal that he would freely hand out if not forced on others. Now, Tina also said that Robin was obsessed with Alvis and had amassed a huge collection of records, coffee cups, pictures and other memorabilia that no one was allowed to touch. When Tina asked Robin if he believed in God, he said, I believe in two things, myself and Elvis Presley. <laughs> what a fucking dick. For, while his obsession with Elvis was indeed strong, it paled in comparison to how much Robin was obsessed with large breasts. To the point, I would say he was haunted by his obsession with large breasts. Now, apparently this infatuation, he said it was genetic. He said, it's a thing in my entire family going back, as I'm told, to my great-grandfather. Each of us men have married large-breasted women. My ex-wife is a 39D, and yes, she was very satisfying to me. You looked big boobs. Like big boobs? Mm. Not a leg man. No. Yes, man. It, I mean, if you're not cutting the nipples off and mutilating him, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. There seems to be a lot of that with, uh, like, serial killers yeah, as well. But, Nipples seem to be a fixation. But also, if your wife has got really big boobs, and she's like, I'm going to have a reduction because it's killing me back. You let her. You let her, of course you let her. It's killing her back. Yeah. Anyway, Robin was also obsessed with how brass were. When his girlfriend, Tina, became pregnant with Robin's third, fourth, and possibly fifth child, Robin insisted that she let him watch her breastfeed after the baby was born so he could see how the milk flowed into the breast. Weird. Now, Tina said for the longest time, all he would talk about was breasts, and that was it. But over the course, these conversations would take dark turns. To that point, Robin was always after Tina to cut off her own nipples so he could see what was inside. He told her that sex workers did it for him all the time, so what's the big deal? It's not like saying, let's do anal. Come on, these hookers are pay. They do it all the time for me. It's no, but no big deal. Or, you know, peg me or something like that. This is cut your own nipples off for me. Yeah, that's a bit extreme. And I don't think sex workers would do that because, you know, then they'd be like, sort of be like, oh, yeah, I want to. Well, I don't. I just don't think. No. Across the board, I don't think men would do that. But anyway, so as far as where Robin wanted to have sex, it seems like he was taking his customized torch van for test drives of assault with Tina, both in the coital fashion and in the torch fashion. When they'd have sex in the van, that, as was Robin's preference, he'd chase her around and stick pins in her breast because inflicting pain was the only way he could get it up. His wife got it the worst. Tina said that one time she went over to Robin and Rosemary's house and noticed that Rosemary, Rosemary was pale and sweaty. When Tina asked what was wrong, Rosemary lifted her blouse to show that Robin had sucked six hat pins into her breasts. And Rosemary said that Robin used to let her remove them, wouldn't let her remove them until he said so. Now, hat pins are fucking... Well, they're massive. They're like... Yeah. Uh, you could kill somebody with a hat yeah. pin. Mike. Now, he also injected Novocaine into her breast so the pain will be bearable enough for her to go about her day, but nevertheless, the wounds still bled constantly. Now, naturally, Rosemary was terrified of Robin to the point where she would actually confide, and she was, remember, this is confiding in a husband's girlfriend because mm -hmm. she had no one else to talk to. So this is his, your, like, husband's girlfriend has come around like what's wrong oh he's done this to me she confided in Liz all this shit it's it's not right it's not anyway besides the breast mutilation and lighting her breasts on fire after dousing them with light fluid he would do extreme breast bond breast bondage and robin also involved dirt and humiliating bestiality and animal cruelty on one occasion, Robin forced Rosemary to bring her parents' big dog over to their house. And what's so strange about this, okay, now this is weird, he made Rosemary bring the dog over so he could have sex with it. Now, remember uh, David Parker Ray? Oh, yeah, the uh, um, he, toy box guy. Yeah, now you'll get a lot of parallels from... Yeah, because I'm getting that, like, there's and a lot. He used to force his dogs to have sex with women, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Now... 
he had sex with the dog this way. Now, he wanted to make her watch him have sex with the dog and to prove that Robin did it when Rosemary told Tina about it, she had a pair of his underwear that was covered in dog hair. So she's like, Tina does this, Luke. Now, later when that dog was about to have puppies, he dragged it into the basement, beat it to death with a baseball bat, cut out the puppy so he could store them in jars of alcohol as a macabre decoration. Don't think he knows it. They weren't going to be his kids. No, I don't think he knows that. But there's a there's a disturbing like degree of worry there. I think like underlying, it's like, just, am I going to have dog people kids? Just like like a dog body with his head, like. Right? But have you seen that like last bit of like what we do in the shadows where they're all fucking mutated? Yeah. Where you had like fucking kids. It's like, is that what you think this is going to happen? <laughs> anyway, speaking of dead bodies, <laughs> he would brag to Tina that he figured out a foolproof way to dispose of a body. He said all you had to do was take the body to a cemetery where they just dug a grave. And you go the night before the funeral. And then when you throw the body into the hole and cover the corpse with dirt. And the next day, the casket would be lowered on top of the victim and the body would disappear forever. Yeah, but what if you got got a like really fucking diligent like sort of grave digger who was like, nah, that's a good it's a good few inches above what I dug. I I I don't think if you I think they'd just be like, I don't give a shit. I mean they're on minimum wage, aren't they? Probably working through the nights. If one here is a grave digger, please tell us if you Please like, tell us if you've if got that like, sort of due diligence. That's not six foot. Actually, that's, I think you'll find that's five foot seven. Like, do you literally hold up a funeral and go, wait, 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 I just need, I just need measure this, get your little ruler out, one of them folding ones. Yeah, pushing the widow, the crying pushing, widow away. Literally throwing a bodily to the fucking ground. Yeah, just getting in there, jumping in on top She's of She's there, my husband, my poor husband, he's like, no, fucking up, there's something, there's, there's something rotten in the state of Denmark here, I need to get my ruler out. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> fact remains though, he would get really happy talking about the prospect of getting rid of a body and would indeed do something similar with one of the Ripper crew's early victims, and it actually worked. So okay. now before long his fantasies of actually killing someone began to inch their way into reality. And he wasn't at all concerned with who saw him doing it, nor was he concerned that anyone was going to turn him into the police. For example, he started building his own primitive torture tools. He built a poker that was constructed by affixing a hat pin to the end of a long broomstick, and he'd use that to chase around Tina, stabbing her and poking her with it. Now, she tried to throw it away, but every time she threw it away, he'd just make another one. Now, more disturbing were his homemade axes. So, he used them, again, got a broomstick, he would embed a thick triangular piece of glass into it, making the weapon that was both terrifying in its primitive appearance and surprisingly efficient in its execution. Will it cut? It will kill. Kill. And tragically, <laughs> let's take it down. And tragically, that first execution would occur in late May 1981. Sorry. What, what's, the, what's that program called? Forged in Fire. Forged in Fire, yeah. Sorry. It's a good program. Probably not that it's a good program. Probably a bit inappropriate. It will kill. Jamie, it will kill. It'll kill. Not as deeply as I'd wanted to, but it cuts. In Dallas, a touch in delicate, but fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> in 1981, Robin, Eddie, Tommy, and Andy started taking out Robin's red van into Chicago to pick up sex workers to assault. And every time, eventually, they would work their way up to murder. Now, after cruising around for a while, Robin spotted a sex worker on the street, always choosing black women because he presumably knew, like Jeffrey Dahmer knew, that a black person's death would get half-hearted investigation at best, especially in the early 80s. Now, at first, Eddie and Andy were the ones who would crawl into the back of the van and stay there just before Robin picked up the potential victim. Now, they'd then wait for two taps from Robin, and at that moment, they'd burst out the back doors and force the sex worker into the van immediately creating an atmosphere of terror. Now, the Ripper crew claimed that the murders started before May of 1981, but in the known murder, Andy and Robin were cruising North Chicago in the torch van when they were pulled over and spoke with a sex worker named Linda Sutton, who worked the area around Wrigley Field. Now, after getting into the van, they drove her to a popular spot 30 miles away where sex workers get the job done for an hourly flee. A place called either the Moonlit Motel or the Rip Van Winkle, depending on the source there. 
in the books, it was a couple of them. I think it's a Rip Van Winkle, though. I mean, but, Rip Van Winkle, staying on brand, do not Yeah, yeah. Now, Linda immediately recognised that something was wrong here and she refused to get out of the van. But on Robin's orders, Andy and Eddie forced her out and while they held her down, Robin punched her in the face until she crumpled down. But instead of taking her into the motel, Robin and Eddie dragged Linda to a field behind the motel where Andy returned to the van and watched from the front seat. Now, according to Andy's later confession, Eddie held Linda down while Robin raped her. Then Robin pulled out his homemade glass broomstick axe and struck Linda three to four times in the chest. He then took a length of piano wire and severed her left breast before returning to Andy. The two of them left in the van while Eddie left in his own car. Of course, leaving the corpse behind in a lonely field behind the Rip Van Winkle where it would stay until the housekeeper noticed the stench three days later. Now, even though Linda Sutton's body had been exposed for just a few days, the large wounds inflicted on the chest, in addition to the removal of the breast, to allow bacteria, parasites and maggots to break down the tissue at an accelerated rate, giving the appearance that the body had been there for weeks. Now, this wasn't necessarily a do not investigate murder because police did investigate a mm, little bit. While the body was near skeletal, the arms were still bound by cheap handcuffs with a broken key still in the lock. Additionally, a strip of cloth had been stuffed into the mouth, presumably to muffle any screaming. And while there were no shoes on the body, there were still socks, and stuffed inside those socks was a sum of $13. Now, once the detectives couldn't find any missing persons reports that fit the description of the body, they rightfully pegged her as a murdered sex worker, which, as we know, happened fairly often, well, extremely often in the 70s and 80s. And eventually she was identified by fingerprints and dental records. But they were somewhat puzzled that she had money because carrying money made prostitution charge much more likely should the cops catch a woman in the act. Now, we know one thing about serial killers is they're usually pretty extensive cooling off period between the first and second murders. Sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's five years. And that cooling off period often gets shorter and shorter the more murders they commit. But with the speed in which the Ripper crew moved on to the victims 2 and 3 implies that either a group dynamic shortens the cooling off period or that Robin Gecht had been murdering on his own long before he brought Eddie, Tommy and Andy into the fold. Now, just a month after killing Linda Sutton, Eddie and Robin picked up another black woman and a woman who is to this day unidentified. She was a hitchhiker. They gave her some pills and took her to a cemetery, pulled her out of the van and beat her with a baseball bat. He then returned to the car, but Robin stayed behind. And after five minutes, Robin returned with one of the woman's severed breasts. That's when he starts taking trophies. Okay. Well, about a month after that, Eddie, Robin was giving Eddie a ride home to pick up his paycheck at the Winchell's Donut House where Eddie worked part-time. But instead of picking up Eddie's paycheck at Winchell's, the two psychopaths spotted another black woman hitchhiking. So Robin and Eddie told Eddie um, to climb into the back rear of the van and the woman was then picked up unaware that there was a guy in the back and Robin drove her to a fo forest preserve. When Robin stopped the car in a suitably secluded area, he tapped twice on the floor of the van, signaling Eddie to exit through the back to meet Robin up front with a knife and a pair of handcuffs. The second hitchhiker, also never identified, was handcuffs and led into the woods by Robin alone. When he returned five minutes later, he was again in possession of a severed breast. These trophies, by the way, will be kept on Robin's van's floor between the seats. Right. So just put them in between the seats. Now, to keep the van from reaching, like, Richard Chase levels of gore, he kept a five-gallon bucket and some dish soap around to clean up after every murder. Presumably, this was because Robin was still using the van every day as well for his business. Now, the Ripper crew then went almost a year before their next murder, following that three-month three-kill spree in 1981, but when they returned in May of 1982, they killed at least 15 people in less than six months. Now, the first, fourth murder, it wasn't connected to the Ripper crew at all until Eddie Sprites later confessed to it, because the police had no body until Eddie told them where he was. At this point, the fourth murder, the police thought it was a missing persons case and this woman had just disappeared. And now the details all scan from this, but what we can piece together, Robin, Eddie, and Tommy, and this was Tommy's first time out with them, by the way, they saw 21-year-old Lorraine Borowski walking to her job as a secretary at a little Remax re real estate office at 8.30am in the wealthy Chicago suburb of Elmhurst. 
Now, after following her into the office where she was the first to arrive that day, the ripper crew grabbed her, dragged her to the van, and then took her to a nearby motel where a gag was stuffed into her mouth and the beating began. Now, while Eddie claimed to have nothing more than a voyeur at this point, Tommy said that both Robin and Eddie raped her before Eddie took out a three-foot length of piano wire. It was wrapped around her breast and tightened until the appendage was severed. Taking the depravity even further, they both, both Robin and Eddie, then had sex with the wound in Lorraine's chest. And then, Robin used his glass axe to finish the job. The body was taken to a cemetery in Clarendon Hills where the Ripper crew hid her remains in a mausoleum. And the corpse would stay there until Eddie told the police where to look. Now, they're doing this in broad daylight now. These are, yeah. This is a secretary going into her, and they're just running in and grabbing it. So they're fucking peeking at you. Now, it does get worse from here on out. So strap yourselves in. On the day of the kidnapping and murder of Lorraine Borowski, it was obvious to her boss when he walked in that something terrible had happened. Her shoes were on the floor, cosmetics were strewn about the office, her keys were left behind, and the police questioned nearby business owners. And in fact, one store owner in the same, same shopping plaza had a vague memory of a reddish orange van parked in an area of the parking lot that was normally empty. Now, this is a solid lead, right? Because the van that they had it was basically the van that they drove but instead of following that trail the cops listened to the guy who owned a nearby liquor store and said he'd seen Lorraine that morning getting into a car he said I saw Lorraine she got into a car and the car drove off but I can't remember what kind of car it was okay so the detective on the case brought in another detective who also happened to be a certified hypnotist because that's what you want. You know, so he then went into the subconscious of this liquor store's owner's brain. He was like, oh, look into my eyes, look into my eyes, not around the eyes, not over the eyes, look into my eyes, like that. Now, he was like, yeah, Lorraine Borowski, she definitely got into a sports car, either a Thunderbird or a Cougar. Now, even though... This was just like... Let's just, you've got somebody who said, no, saw a van parked there. No one's usually parked there. It's a big red van, yeah. right? And I look at story, I was like, yeah, I saw her. She got in a car, can't remember what time. I bring me mate in. He's a hypnotist. That's not the normal reaction, is it? No. Like... And it's like, this is the, fucking investigation to do for a white woman who's like a normal person not a sex worker hypnotist why would you bring a fucking hypnotist in it's like when they bring those fucking psychics in isn't it mm -hmm. remember when dog the bounty hunter kept saying he was like 24 hours behind um that guy who kills um that you blonde youtuber woman what was her name gavin oh. petito yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, dog was like, I'm 24 hours behind. He was flying that thing saying like, hi there. Uh, and the guy had been dead for weeks. I'm like, which is shit, Dr. Bounty Hunter. Good show though. I love Dr. Bounty Hunter. Terrible, terrible racist though. Doesn't Didn't he get like fucked as well? Because like he took things over state lines and it was like, yeah. Yeah. We don't do oh, that in I, Mexico. We don't do that here. And also, he's a terrible racist. Terrible racist. Doesn't like black people. Come for me, dog. What are you going to do? So he skinned Noel Edmonds on fairly sure. Yeah. He, he looks like he skinned James Hetfield. That's a good point. That's more accurate than yeah. Noel Edmonds. Yeah. And his wife just clucks breasts. Do you remember that episode of South Park where he was... Uh, She's caught? dead now. She is? God rest your soul. <laughs> uh, but can you remember when um, Cartman became um, dog, the hall monitor? And he had his like his fucking what his girlfriend was just like you, all you could see was her eyes like there because it just had these massive tits. Oh, and the dead, the, <laughs> oh monitor, <laughs> got these guys to help me. I only pay them fifty bucks. <laughs> fucking love that bit. Oh, sorry. Anyway, even though the referee had taken a year between murders three and four, 
Weird is five and twenty occurred in that this short six month period, and not hardly these cases were covered by the press. Fifteen murders in a six month period, barely touched by the press. Jesus. Anyway, first of all, Chicago had a lot of murders in the late seventies and eighties. And between 1979 and 81, which was their active years, Chicago averaged 865 murders per year, seven of which were related to, quote, unquote, sex and perversion. It's pretty broad. Mm. But the fact remains that the year in which Chicago Rippers were the most active, the number of murders related to so-called sex and perversion more than doubled to 18 from the year before. Now, next up was a woman named Shoei Mack, and she was murdered by Chicago Rippers just two weeks after the 8am kidnapping and murder of Lorraine Borowski. Now, as it was with Lorraine, Shoei Mack was not a sex worker because by this point, the Rippers were acting on near instinct, taking every opportunity to pick up and murder any young woman alone on the streets, no matter what she did for a living. Now, Shoei Mack was... Oh, right. This one... Listen to this one. Does this one hit a bit hard? This one hits a bit hard, right. Shui Mack, she was a 30-year-old Chinese immigrant who'd been driving home with her brother, Kent, after they'd helped close down their family's Chinese food restaurant. Behind them, in their own car, were the owners of the Chinese food restaurant, Shui and Kent's parents. Now, Shui and her brother got into an argument during the drive, so he kicked her out of the car, thinking that her parents would see her and pick her up. But when Shui's parents arrived at home, after Shui's brother Kent discovered his set, parents had missed Shui standing on the shoulder. Imagine being him. Mm. Kicking her out and thinking, Mom and Dad will pick him up. And they didn't. And then she's dead. She's still just trying to like, close down that restaurant, though. No, no, closing it down, as in, it's finished for the night. So you, oh, it's just finished for the night. Yeah. Holy shit, I thought this was more nefarious than it was. No, they I thought she'd come back them. into the country and they'd got some health and safety thing. And it's like, no, no, we've got to do this for no, the public. they've literally God. gone. Like, oh, closing up, I'll help you put the, wipe the tables down, put the chairs on the table. Oh, right, that's what you meant. I, I completely missed just looking, I, that was a bit like Hobbesy, and that was, wasn't it? Now, to her um, extreme misfortune, Shay Mack had picked up by the red van by Robin Gett and the Ripper crew. Now, according to Eddie Spritzer, he and Robin had been driving around near 2 a.m. when they saw Shui Mack standing on the side of the road. Robin quickly told Eddie to get into the back and he picked up Shui. Now, after driving for about 20 minutes, Robin stopped and tapped twice, which was the signal for Eddie to emerge. Now, after pulling Shui out of the van, Robin and Eddie beat her before Robin cut off her breast while Eddie held a wire around her throat. Robin then told Eddie to go grab a knife from the van and when he returned, he found that Robin was having sex with the wounds in Shui's chest. Robin then took the knife and cut open Shui's stomach, which was apparently too much for Eddie. He got nauseous and returned to the van. Oh, that's what he claimed. He's like, oh yeah, he's fucking that, where that breast used to be, that's fine. Good cut her in the stomach, oh, too much for me there, mate. Can go over here, but you went a bit too far there. He didn't like the guts, he didn't like a bit of entrails. Now, Robin joined him soon after and they drove off, leaving Shui Mack's mutilated body behind in the field where she was murdered. It was only a mile and a half from where her brother had thrown her out of the car. Now, by the time Shui Mack's body was found four months after her death, Chicago police had started to notice that out of the hundreds of murders they had to deal with, every once in a while, a woman's body was shown up with one or both breasts missing. Well, this, of course, meant that Chicago was unlucky enough to be dealing with a serial killer. And lots of times, as we've seen again and again and again, with serial killer investigations, the bodies get exhumed. And so Chicago police were very upfront to the Matt family saying, look, if you bury it, we're probably going to have to exhume the body. But they were devout Buddhists, and their beliefs state that once the body is buried, can't be disturbed. No, no. So these people had to go through the further indignity of having her body stored at the medical examiner's facility until Eddie Spritzer was convicted three years after a murder. Then, and only then, was the body put to rest. That's bad. Like, if you're a Buddhist. Yeah, and it's like, no, we won't get there. And the police are like, okay. But then the police are like, well, are we even going to? bother to find it 
these people will be finding them. They're not white, like, and it like that's what it comes off at. Essentially, not to be that guy, but it's like, oh well, you know, if they had a certain amount of melanin in this, mm. you know, the melanin levels. Check that. Uh, we're not going to fucking bother, are we? Now, investigators got their first real lead into the Chicago Ripper case in the June of 1982, but at the time, not enough bodies had been found to establish that there was a serial killer on the loose. So in June 1982, a sex worker named Angel York was on her corner of North Avenue when Robin Gett pulled up alone in his van, shoved the 45 in her face and ordered her to get inside. After driving a few blocks to a deserted factory district, he forced Angel through a plywood door that separated the cab from the car- van's cargo hold. Now, what's interesting about this attempted murder is that one of the few in which Robin acted alone, or at least it's one of the few that we know of, but it's doubly interesting because Robin specifically chose not to murder Angel York. Now, after binding her feet and handcuffing her right hand to her left foot and her left foot to a shelf, her left hand to a shelf, sorry, Robin put duct tape over Angel's mouth and got undressed himself. He then pulled out a long knife and cuffed one of her hands, pointed the gun in her face and told her to cut her own breast. Now, Angel did as much as she could, but soon she started to pass out. That's when Robin reached over and ripped the wound open before he had sex with the wound and ejaculated into it. He then covered the wound with duct tape and kicked Angel out of the van without killing her. Now, security guards found her soon barely alive and she was taken to a nearby hospital where she gave a statement describing Robin and the van. And she said, he's a white guy, he's driving a red van, and he's got a roach clip hanging from the rear view mirror that held two feathers, a blue feather and a white feather. But it seemed the police just added the van to the watch out for this guy pile. Now, Robin Getz was alone during his near deadly assault on Angel Yore, and as far as we know, this was somewhat rare. From what it seems like, half of the charge that Robin got from these murders was in directing the other three members to the Ripper crew to commit horrific acts. Now, one possible example of this, if it's true, is what Tommy, Co- Tommy Coccarellis claimed. Tommy said that Robin forced the other three members of the Ripper crew to eat the breasts of their victims during satanic rituals held in Robin's apartment. Now, it is said that Robin had an altar of sorts in his attic where he was said that he has a copy of the satanic Bible and it was found in his apartment. It's more important to, now that we know about the satanic panic in mm. the 80s and what we know about patterns of satanic panic. Specifically, it's important to know how easily children were led on by investigators to bait up fucked up nonsensical claims like, oh, you know, did they abuse you? No. Did they abuse you? No. This puppet says they did. Yeah, they did. There we go. We'll get into that one day. The fucking... We've got to get into the satanic uh, panic. Also, like, the British, like... Because I know, like, we do a lot of American stuff, um, but I think a good in would be, like, the British side of things. Because that was a big thing. Yeah. Well, like, with, like, with Highgate, like, that Highgate vampire, oh. like, fucking case, that's brilliant. We'll do that. You will do that. So, in the case of the Chicago Rippers, they didn't have a child, but they have someone with the intelligence of the t- child, which was Tommy. Now... As we know, satanic panic cases were notorious for creating massive satanic conspiracies that have no grounding in reality. Now, these are often created through extended games of yes and that occur between investigators and victims. Now, that game would be played by investigators as suspects, and invariably those suspects weren't the brightest balls in the box, and they were almost always people pleasers. Now, according to Tommy's confession concerning the satanic elements of the murders, the Ripper crew would gather in Robin's apartment after his wife went to work, and there in the apartment, in the apartment's attic, they would worship something or other at an altar adorned with six red and black. I love it, something or other. Yeah. It was something or other. And after they all knelt together on the altar, he would produce the breasts of murder victims from a trophy box, and while he read pass- passages from the Christian Bible, each man would masturbate onto a severed breast, and then everyone finished, Robin would allegedly cut them up and hand the PC van for everyone to eat. This is what Tommy claimed. He's a bit. I think it's bullshit. It sounds yeah. like bullshit. Now, he said he was only involved in two murders, and he participated in dozens of rituals, though. When police asked him why he participated in so many, Tommy said in all seniors that Robin had supernatural powers. So this kid, this guy, has got the mentality of a child. Bit like um, Jesse Miss Kelly from the West Memphis Three. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he knew nothing. Anyway. Um, Tom, Useful idiot, essentially. Yeah. You know, basically, he said, Tommy said he was afraid of what Robin would do or just Tom, and if Tommy didn't go along with everything. Tommy said, he looks into your eyes and he tells you to do something and you just have to do it. You should be real careful when you talk to him, Detective Sam. Don't look into his eyes. He'll get you too. Now, after the attack on Angel York, all police knew they might be looking for a little guy with greasy hair driving a red van. But from what I can tell from the books, they haven't quite connected him to the Ripper murders themselves because I don't think they knew at this point the Ripper murders had happened. Now, the ambiguity would change very quickly into certainty after Angel York came sex worker Sandra Delaware, whose body was left under a bridge and after being gang raped by Ed, Andy, Eddie and Robin. As a final indignity before she died, Andy forced the neck of a wine bottle up her anus and made her sit on it and then pushed her down on the bottle, shoving it up into her innards and releasing a large pool of blood. Now, after Sandra, it was marketing executive Rose Davis, whose very public murder was arguably what finally brought the Chicago Rippers to the front pages of Chicago papers. Now, Rose was kidnapped off the street by Andy Adina Robin while she was just walking to her car at 2.30 a.m. She just stayed out late having drinks with her client. And, you know, she's a marketing executive. They do. And then she was taken to an alleyway where the Ripper crew mutilated her extensively in public. When her body was found half sitting against a wall in an alley, she was murdered. Her nose and eye sockets were all crushed. Her jaw was broken and her face was unrecognisable. Once again, her breast was slashed with such force that blood spatters were found in a nine-foot radius around her body and a piece of broken lumber was shoved into her vagina up to the small intestine. All of this was done while she was still alive. Now, at this point, the police definitely knew there was a serial killer on the loose, although they had no idea that the murders were actually being committed by a team of serial killers. The police then brought in Robert Ressler to consult. Now, Robert Ressler was spot on with his profiles at times, but when it came to the Ripper case, he sort of, fucked it up. He did guess that the killer was small and skinny, and he also said that the killer was effeminate features and was most likely bisexual, perhaps even latently homosexual. From this profile, Robert Ressler unfortunately led police to a hairdresser with the fantastic name of Jacques Monaco. Well, that's brilliant. Yeah. So Jacques Monaco lived in one of the buildings that was separated by the alley in which Rose Davies was killed and abandoned. Now, he did say he heard a commotion outside but he didn't call 911. They found that suspicious but they eventually let it go when it became obvious that a man such as Shah Monaco could never be so guilty of such a crime. How dare you accuse Shah Monaco of such a thing. What, Shah Monaco? Now, the murder of Rose Davies was reckless and we can assume from this that Ripper Crew's next murder that they and especially Robin Gap were starting to feel invincible. Case in point, October the 6th, 1982, Eddie was driving the Red River van through a Puerto Rican neighbourhood while Robin rode in the passenger seat. They spotted three guys at a phone booth and while Eddie told, and Robin told Eddie to slow down. Completely on impulse and without any motivation whatsoever, he pulled out a 38 Special in a rifle and just fired five shots at the guys, telling Eddie to speed away. They killed one guy, shot him in the head, paralysed another, shot him in the head, and the third guy ran off. And when the Ripper crew was caught, Eddie admitted to these crimes, but he's like, I don't know why he did it. He's like, yeah, we did it, but I don't know why. Now, as always with serial killers, it's when they get reckless that they get caught. And hours after a drive-by shooting, Robin would pick up his last victim. This one, however, would survive to positively identify her assailant. Now, Beverly Washington was a sex worker working her usual corner on North Avenue and through and got picked up by Robin and he offered her $25 for fellatio. Now she agreed, but once she walked through the plywood door separating the cab from the cargo, Robin pulled his gun and told her that if she only did what he said, he wouldn't get hurt. Now she was been around the block for a quiet while, and she'd figured out and she'd run across what some girls called a hookah freak. So some so-called hookah freaks were guys who got off on humiliation. They liked getting peed on, they liked getting told that they were bad boys and all that stuff. But some, like she assumed of Robin, liked to hold a gun to a woman's head while she screamed. It was a request. 
But there wasn't anything particularly dangerous about the gun scenario as long as the gun wasn't loaded. But with Robin, once the knife came out, she knew that she'd landed in a bad spot. And when Robin forced her to swallow a handful of pills, she had no idea whether or not she was going to wake up again. But wake up she did the next morning on North Maple Mud where a homeless man found her. Her left breast had been removed so completely that her ribs were visible and her right breast was attached only by a few strands of Beverly. But the important thing was that Beverly was still alive. She was taken to the nearest hospital where she was stabilised, although she was able to speak when the detectives arrived. Now, they were anxious to get whatever information they could, so they asked her a series of yes or no questions, telling her to blink for a yes and shake her head for a no. They soon confused confirmed that she had been picked up by a greasy little white guy in a red van. And before long, they had her writing words describing her attacker, moustache, blue jeans, flannel shirt, greasy hair. When asked to describe the van, she wrote, roach clip, rear view mirror, two feathers, white blue. And with that, Beverly's descriptions matched those of Angel York's. So the police had had everything they needed to know with the search, although there, apparently there was a shitload of red vans in Chicago. But on October the 20th, two officers pulled over a red van with a plywood partition and a roach clip hanging from the rear view mirror. And dangling from the roach clip were the two feathers, one white and one blue. But driving the van was Eddie Spritzer. And even though Beverly's description of Robin Gett, the van was exactly as she described it. Now, Eddie stammered and stuttered his way through the entire stop and immediately said, it's not my van. He said, it's Robin Gett's van. And he gave him the address. So they went to Robin's house, and Get was at ease. He was smiling, and he showed no sign he knew why the cops were there. Regardless, though, he matched Beverly Washington's description of a gritty little fuck perfectly, so they hauled his ass in. Now, Beverly easily picked him out of a lineup, saying, that's the motherfucker. So Robin was arrested, and since Eddie was driving the van, he was arrested too. Reportedly, when Robin was told he was being arrested, he responded with an open mouth and put his hand to his, tr- to his chest like going, ah! What? Me? Me? However, all they could charge Robin was with aggravated battery, deviant sexual assault, on robbery and kidnapping. Now, Robin, he said nothing. He just said, I want to speak to a lawyer. He just kept saying over and over again, I want a lawyer, I want a lawyer, I want a lawyer. Never said anything, never confessed to anything. But even though Robin Gett refused to cooperate in any way whatsoever and just kept deflecting and deflecting, Eddie Spritzer was a different story. Now, he basically sung like a canary. He fell to pieces and filed a 78-page written statement detailing his relationship with Robin Gett and the murders they committed together as the Ripper crew. And from what Eddie said, the first actual murder occurred when they picked up a sex worker and they blindfolded him and gagged her. Robin then shot her in the head. With tra- which sort of tracks with what we know about escalating serial killer behavior. It starts very simple, then gets much ornate, and it goes on and on and on. Now, the disposal method, however, was quite different. Now, no, God knows where they got them from, but Andy, Eddie, and Robbie chained bowling balls to the victim's neck and feet before they threw her into a body of water. Now, when it came to the known murders, Eddie, like went between taking responsibility and removing himself from the process altogether. He claimed to have once vomited after Robin beat a woman with a hammer, which was presumably Rose Davies. But Eddie was also admitted to cutting off breasts and he admitted to having sex with the gaping wounds. But Eddie's wishy-washiness, like a woman he'd known him for six years, said that she called him a sissy for one reason or another on a random day. They were talking about something and just said, like, oh, Eddie, you're such a sissy, and responded by saying that he wasn't a sissy because he'd killed a couple of broads and, quote, cut their tits off, that it was very messy. But by the time Eddie... Bit fin- Yeah. <laughs> but by the t- time Eddie finished with his first statement, he'd given up seven murders and one aggravated assault, which investigators felt they could use against Robin Gector's leverage. But according to what Eddie claimed later, years later, the interrogation process was far worse than a gentle conversation. According to his story, it took five days for him to break with a detective named Flynn psychologically and physically torturing him. From what Eddie said, Detective Flynn took him out to the woods and forced him to dig a grave. He was allegedly pushed into the grave and the detective kept finding his handgun near Eddie's head again and again. They said the cop had to reload three times. 
Jesus. To his help. After running out of bullets, the cops allegedly took Eddie to a car wash and used a pressure hose to remove the grave dirt. And that's why nobody saw. Then once the detective shift was over, Eddie was taken by two more detectives to an abandoned house where they'd beat him for hours. Then after he passed out, he said they pissed on him. Now it sounds pretty extreme, but it's not that far-fetched when it comes to the Chicago Police Department. Now, during the 70s and 80s, the Chicago cops, and this is documented, would use cattle prods on suspects' testicles, they would suffocate them with plastic bags, and they would burn them with cigarettes, they would beat them senseless, or to elicit confessions. But what doesn't make sense when it comes to Eddie's story is that he told them about at least two murders that the cops hadn't attached to the ripper at all, and Eddie had led him police to the mausoleum where the body of Lorraine Barrowitz was laying undiscovered for over a year. But the Chicago police, they usually reserved their extreme coerced confessions for black men, especially in the 70s and 80s. Eddie Spritzer was very, very white, and besides, if anyone was going to be tortured into a confession, it was going to be Robin Gett, because he was the only one who explicitly described by two near victims. And when Robin Gett was questioned, he was always friendly, but remained adamant that he was a real victim. After being shown pictures of the victims, he dismissed them. Even after Robin was shown that Eddie was actively cooperating with the police, he didn't fucking flinch. He didn't phase him for a second. Okay. Instead, he would well up during descriptions of murders. He'd give them puppy dog eyes and say that he'd never hurt anyone in his life. And interestingly, once Eddie heard that Robin was denying everything, Eddie took his lead and then changed his story saying, yeah, Robin never hurt anyone. No, he never did. Now, inside Eddie, instead, Eddie was now saying that the real killer was his ex-girlfriend's brother, his co-worker, Andy Coverellis. Now, while Andy was being looked into, Robin was ill-advisedly let out on a bond after a middle-aged woman that he was having a sexual relationship with took out a mortgage on a house to bail him out. All else, immediately, he went out and picked up a woman. This woman was named was Cynthia Smith, immediately went out and he picked her up. He, and she recognised him too late, who, the guy who'd slashed a friend of his. She went to go and try and open the door, but he'd removed the passenger side door handle. Um, and now it's insane to think that nobody in the police department will put a tail on Robin. But Cynthia Smith got lucky. When Robin picked up his homemade glass hatchet and tried to stab her in the face with it, she clawed her way past him and made it out the driver's side door before he sped off. Now, soon after Andy Cockerellis was brought in for questioning, he also confessed before the day was out, going into detail about how the crew had kidnapped women, stabbed them and with everything from knives and razors to tin cans and can openers. Andy Cockerellis confessed to 18 murders, including those of Duck Rose Davis and Lorraine Borowski. But when detectives investigated Robin's whereabouts during the murders that Eddie and Andy confessed to, they found that the crew partied at the Rip Van Winkle Motel. This was where they committed their first known murder, and when they partied there outside of the murder, of course, which they often did, they're usually a fourth guy who also rented a room with Eddie, Robin and Andy, and that was Tommy. And once the police started speaking to the manager at Rip Van Winkle, the manager said he suspected these four men were cultists. So when cops caught up with Tommy, their line of questioning focused on satanic ritual behaviour, and that's where they began. Therefore, once the cops talked to um, poor Tom, Tommy long enough, he began emitting satanic ritual behaviour to make the cops smile. Now, the only murder that Andy confessed to was one that involved the Rip Van Winkle murder of Lorraine Borowski. A cop showed him a picture of Lorraine and Tommy said that he and his brother Andy had taken her for a quote-unquote one-way ride out to the rip. Now, incredibly, Robin Gett was not charged with any murders. While he was implicated by the other three members of the Ripper crew and multiple slaves, there was no physical evidence tying him to those murders because he covered his tracks very well. So remember, he was washing out the van yeah. and everything. And that's the other thing is that Robin Gett kept his mouth shut from start to finish. However, there was a grievous assault against Beverly, Washington, and Angel York. By the end of it, Robin Gett was sentenced to 150 years in prison, which put all of his crimes together. Now, he is still alive, and he still maintains that he's innocent of all the Chicago Ripper murders. Now, technically, he's going to be up for parole in 2042 when he's 89. Now, the only other member of the Ripper crew who wasn't charged, he's the only member of the Ripper crew who wasn't charged and therefore was never found guilty of murder. 
In 84, Eddie Spritzer pled guilty to the murders of Rose Davies, Shay Mack, Sandra Delaware and um, Rafael Torado. Eddie was sentenced to death in 1986, but his sentence was commuted to life in prison in 2003, and he's still alive. Andy Cockrellis was not so lucky. He took his case to trial for the murders of Rose and Lorraine Borowski, and was therefore also sentenced to death. But while Eddie Spritzer managed to play the appeal game long enough, Andy didn't. He was the last person ever to be executed in the state of Illinois. Now, he was killed by a lethal injection on March 19th, 1999, and he became a political football between anti-death penalty and pro-death penalty proponents. Now, even though Tommy was sentenced to 70 years for the murder of Lorraine Borowski as part of a plea agreement, his sentence was cut in half for good behaviour in 2017. He was denied that release that year and because he had nowhere to live. But two years later, a church in Aurora, Illinois, the home of Wayne's World, they agreed to take Tommy under their care, where he remains to this day, and he's likely going to die there. Now, the story ends with another coincidence, but as big as the Gacy one, though. In 1999, Robin Geck's son, David Geck, was charged with first-degree murder in gang-related killing of a man named Roberto Cruz. David spent 22 years in prison despite the fact that witnesses on the scene said that Cruz was killed by two large Latino men. David Gett, besides being white, was smaller than his father. He was five foot five. He was definitely not a large Latino man, much less two of them. But he'd confessed after being beaten by a detective named Ronaldo Guevara. Now, Guevara had also threatened Greg's then pregnant 18 year old girlfriend, allegedly taking telling her that she would have to give birth in jail if she didn't implicate David. As it turned out, though, Guevara was afraid a piece of shit who had seven convictions overturned since 2017 due to misdeeds involving false confessions, and there are 20 more being investigated. So Guevara would choose random men tangentially related to murders that he was investigating and plunge them into a near Kafkaesque nightmare of beatings and threats that all ended in false confessions. As a result, Davy Gett spent 22 years in prison. He was exonerated just last year because, incidentally, having experienced in real life what well, was likely only a fantasy to his fa father's partners in murder. And thus ends the ballad of the Chicago Ripper Crew. Jesus. Sick fucks, aren't they? Mm hmm. Yeah. Like, it, that is up there, like, top tier of. David Parker Ray, grossness, Sylvia Likens, torture, Junko Furuta that we've done. I think, like... Trees and all shit. Uh, it's the Toy Box Killer all the way for me. It was yeah. just, well, I don't know. But I voiced that fucker. Know, so, yeah. like, that was horrible. Um, but, no, I've come to this, like, through a, like, the, there was a documentary, like, I think it was a documentary on Netflix which was going through satanic yeah. cases, because obviously this has been all linked mm. up with the satanic thing. Um, so I was quite familiar, but at this, it's, it's still just fine. It is. Like, yeah. But, yeah, I told you it was gruesome. Um, if you made it this far, well done. Uh, please leave a like, leave a comment and all that shit. Have they got away with that, like, for... And then just doing it in like broad daylight. Uh, fucking mental, isn't it? But yeah, um, but thank you for watching. Um, if you do like what we do, you can give us money on Patreon if you want to. Um, at www.patreon.com forward slash enter the dark, anything from a dollar to fifty dollars. But membership thing on YouTube's there now. You can do that if you want. Um, but yeah, the names of everyone is going up on the screen, man need a strong cup of tea after that one yeah don't worry that's that can be arranged tea. but yeah i've been yan he's been les take care bye bye